Hey everybody, it's P.D. Trigger, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. Yep, it's me, your friend, old Pedro. Hey, we've got, because it's the playoffs and things are starting and, uh, you know, we'd like to be kind of themey with these things. And of course, because I like the Dodgers, we've got a show that talks about the genesis of Dodger Stadium and, and what the O'Malley's and what the city of L.A. and the families who lived in what they called Chavez Ravine had to go through to make Dodger Stadium happen. Dodger Stadium is one of the the premier stadiums in all of baseball. We've talked to DJ Severe. We've talked to Todd Lights. We've talked to, I mean, <laughs> so many people from that from that organization. And they're all in a spot that was other families' homes. And so, oh, by the way, we talked to Joe Davis, who was the voice of the Dodgers. So when when you look at this story, and and the, and the author who wrote the book is called Eric Nussbaum, and he tells this really hard story between the development of an area. And then the people that live in these areas, you don't typically develop something that wealthy people own because they're like, hey, we already live here. It's already developed. It's already nice. And so this is that that give take. And it's one of the reasons why the Dodgers left New York is that the spot where they thought they could go to build their stadium, it kept getting taken up by something else and it wasn't on the plan. And so they're like, we have to go somewhere else. And so the city of L.A. is like, we have this failed project. We have this failed land. What if you guys came and took this and we'll pay these families fair market rate, uh, fair market share for their homes and then everybody will win? Well, that's great, except for not everybody agrees on this plan. And so what happens, of course, ultimately the sheriff and bulldozers come and they forcefully remove these families from Chavez Ravine. So this is sort of like a thing where, you know, the county has to play bad guy to the benefit of all of Southern California. I mean, really. And then these families, the ones that decided, so the ones that left, they they moved on and and they got going. But the ones that stayed, you know, they were scarred and the community took a long time to heal from that. And there's still some some pain from that because a lot of these folks are still alive. Anyhow, that's the story of of Chavez Ravine and, and Eric's fantastic book. As always, if you guys go to the Amazon links, you can support us there. Uh, Audible, if you're in the Audible at all, you think you might be. I'm listening right now to a thing called Heist and it's hosted by Michael Caine. It's like a limited series with all these great heists and capers and i just i just can't get enough of it so i love audible and if you go to breakitdownshow.com and you click on either one of the it's like one of the first things on the website is is either audible or you can get um, anything from amazon both those links are there if you do that that helps us out it puts a couple of bucks in our pockets and you know we can buy new gear and that kind of thing it's not a lot but it is a great way to support us and i really do think that you'll enjoy audible and actually if you get audible let me know and i'll share a book with you that i like there's all kinds of things maybe we can book club it or something all right enough about that stuff one more thing to promote and as you know i'm always talking about save the brave so save the brave save the brave.org put a couple dollars in the uh, pot and we're going to put it to work. You know, we lost someone, um, uh, two relationships away from me, uh, this just week and lost one last week too. This is still happening every day. You talk about a scourge, we talk about all these different things that we worry about and this continues to go and it's actually accelerated. So now more than ever, it's a lot of help. If you can put a couple of dollars in there and you know, we weren't able to do our golf tournament this year because of COVID and it's a big fundraiser for us. So help us cover some of these gaps. All right. Enough about me beating you up on that. Look for more changes. We got a whole bunch of new things, by the way, album fights are back in production. So Mike and I are working on that. If you like album fights, great. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look in the album fight tab. You will find it, and it's an incredible uh, thing that we do, and we're going to get right back to it. All right, enough about all that stuff. Here comes Eric Nussbaum. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Greg Newsbomb. You're watching the Break It Down Show. Hey, this is Greg Newsbomb. You're watching the Break It Down Show. Yeah, we got Eric on. So first off, uh, Eric, you probably don't know this because uh, you're not a huge fan of the Break It Down show yet. We've had a number of Dodger type folks on the show in the past. We had uh, DJ Severe, who rocks the Dodger Stadium uh, sound system and is, by our math, the most listened to DJ, live DJ in the world. Because Dodger Stadium puts three point something million people in the stands every every uh, year, except for this year. We've also had the voice of the Dodgers, Todd Lights, who is, you know, the voice of God at the stadium. 
And, you know, just a number of people like that throughout uh, the history of the show. We had, uh, you know, back when he first signed, Joe Davis came on the show. And for those that don't know, Joe is the voice of the Dodgers on the on the radio. He's he re he didn't replace it. He took over when Vince Scully left because no one replaces Vince. So we've had a little bit of a Dodger pedigree around here, in part because, you know, I like the Dodgers. Also because, so my, my co-founder, John, uh, he is a, a Giants fan. And so I'm like, hey, the Dodgers are giving us press passes and letting us interview DJ Severe at the stadium. And so he says uh, live, you know, when we record, he's like, you know, I always love the Giants, but the Dodgers are my girlfriend. You know, they they take oh, care wow. of me. And the, he tweeted this story out, and the Giants put up a picture of Michael Corleone giving Fredo the kiss. <laughs> he, betrayed, he betrayed his family. Yeah. But keep in mind, the Giants never would respond to us in a professional manner. So we were like, you know, we'd already given them the kiss. Yeah. But the Giants are always still welcome back, of course. No hard feelings. It's a fun story. Uh, you have a, an incredible story. Your book is called Stealing Home, and you wrote it about, I guess I guess you would just say, like the, the saga of creating Dodger Stadium out of the, the place where actual people lived. Um, and I want to get into that because when, when we look at it, like, have, look, a place like New York, you know, and, 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 you know, Ed Norton did a whole movie about, you know, the development of New York and, and that push and pull between taking care of people and making sure they've got a place to live and, you know, advancing. I mean, like New York needs subways and train places and freeways and L.A. does, too. So Walter O'Malley moves the team out from Brooklyn and they have to put a stadium somewhere and you fill the gap between, hey, we found a place to put it and basically like the 59 World Series. So let's talk about your book. Sure. Uh, the book is called Stealing Home, and it's really a story about L.A. more than it's a story about baseball, probably, to be honest. It's a story about how the city developed sort of powerful forces and innocent people and a little bit of that, like, Chinatown stuff. Yeah. It follows, in particular, these three communities that we now call Chavez Ravine, right, where Dodger Stadium is. It's, um, there were these three neighborhoods there called Palo Verde, La Loma, and Bishop. And uh, they were mostly Mexican, Mexican-American. And in the late 40s, the city decided that those neighborhoods should be raised to make way for a giant public housing project. It was going to be the most ambitious housing project in the country. It was going to be beautiful architecturally. I mean, at the time, public housing didn't have like a taboo around it as much. It was a real possibility for how to you know, deal with LA's giant uh, population crunch, which sounds kind of familiar, probably. Yeah. And, before that housing project could get built, but after most of the families had lost their homes already to eminent domain, the main official behind the housing project was out as a communist at a hearing. And oh. this was in the middle of the Red Scare. Uh, opponents to public housing were kind of whipping up McCarthyist fears and the project got trapped. So this land sat mostly empty for years with a few families that were hanging on, fighting to get their homes back, saying, well, you're not gonna build a housing project, let us stay, you know, we, we're homeowners. Ultimately, the city did not let them stay. They sold the land to the Dodgers and LA County Sheriff's deputies forcibly evicted this family I write about, the Adechigas, on live television in 1959. And then, well, you know, they're now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy when you think about you know, just something as simple as the Red Scare, which was, look, we have our own scares today and, and it's all legitimate in like how people are, are dealing with fear. You know, like, uh, I don't know, I, I could pick a lot of groups, Islamic groups, you know, and, and after 9-11, you know, that would be our Islamic scare and who is and who isn't a bad person and everything. But but it has like these long lasting impacts. But so so if not Chavez Ravine, where else might Tom or uh, where else might the O'Malley's have built their stadium? I don't know. I think that part of what brought them to New York or from New York was the chance to build a stadium there. I mean, they saw Walter O'Malley really wanted a stadium with lots of parking. He wanted easy access from the freeways. And as hard as it is now to get into Dodger games, it was at the confluence of multiple freeways right next to downtown. That site is a big part, I think, of what drew him to Southern California. The city giving him a really good deal on that land and letting him build the stadium he wanted to and dreamed about building. So 
it's hard to say because it's hard to say if they even would have come if if they didn't have the chance to move there. Yeah, they had, and I can't think of her name right now, but they had that lady on the city council. And the crazy thing is, is this story seems like it's ancient times and Dodger Stadium is the, is the third oldest stadium in the major leagues. But a lot of these people are still alive. I mean, you know, Peter O'Malley is still with us and, you know, he was – you know, old enough to remember everything from this time. H how was the research in terms of getting people to talk to you about this, who were actually part of this whole thing? It was challenging. I mean, it, it was really rewarding and challenging, you know, getting people to talk who lived in these communities to excavate the trauma of, you know, getting, imagine you, you have a house and somebody says, we're going to take away your house to build something that society needs. And that sucks. You know, it sucks to lose your home. And then instead of them building it, they sell it to a rich guy from out of state. Like, that's that's horrible. And so people who had this happen to them are still traumatized by it. It, it's a, it changes your life. It's one of those things that you never forget. And those interviews were rewarding for me because, you know, they make the book. But they also, they're heavy and yeah. really respectful of that experience. And then you have people like Peter O'Malley, who he was young. He was like a high school, college kid when this stuff happened. But, you know, he was being groomed by his father, Walter, to take over the Dodgers one day, which he did. And, you know, he's protective of his father's legacy. And he doesn't love the fact that this stuff all happened and that this stuff gets talked about. But to his credit, you know, he, he opened up his father's archives to me. You know, his father, Walter O'Malley, was a brilliant visionary when it came to baseball and seeing what it could become. Dodger Stadium is a monumental achievement of architecture, I think. Like, And it's a beautiful ballpark still. And that's because of Walter O'Malley. And I'm so appreciative that he gave me that insight into his dad. Um, Roz Wyman, the council member, she did not want to talk right. to me. <laughs> she did not. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. She's done a lot of interviews on this stuff, to her credit. But I, I think that my book was really centering those families and her relationship with those families was not necessarily always good. Uh, so she probably just didn't think it was worth it. Yeah. And I can understand that. And like you said, she talked about this uh, a lot and there's a lot of existing data you can use to, to get exactly what she would give you. I, I want to spend a little more time on the O'Malley part because it, it's going to be easy on the back end to, to sort of tear down a lot of the good things. So I want to kind of buttress this because these are complex things. I mean, uh, the story of Moses out in, uh, uh, what's his name out in New York? I can't think of his first name. What's his name? Robert Moses. Yeah. And, and so he and Walter have to go round and round. And and that guy was was exactly the same thing. He was this power player. And if you wanted to get something built, it was him. And he had a vision for what New York was going to be. And, you know, the O'Malley plan just wasn't going to fit into that. So, you know, you have like it's it's enormously it's an enormous story. I mean, it really does cover the two biggest cities in the nation. I mean, Ellie at that time is is what it's uh it's about half the size that, that it is now. Like it had really already exploded. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, LA at the time was, I think, already the third or fourth biggest city in the country. You know, it hadn't right. passed Chicago yet, um, yeah. but it was it was booming. And so it was crazy that there wasn't baseball there before. Like, this was LA. There was two teams in Boston. Boston's tiny. You know, yeah. why <laughs> that team in LA? Um, when excuse me, when O'Malley wanted to replace Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, he wanted to do it his own way. He had a big ego. He had a vision for how this could go. He wanted it to be a privately owned stadium, not publicly owned. He wanted it to be a stadium built in his image, you know, a monument to his vision for what baseball could be. Yeah. Robert Moses was this all powerful kind of like land use boss in New York, insisted that the Dodgers move to Queens in a publicly owned stadium, uh, which ultimately happened with the Mets, right? Shea Stadium was that place. But there's two very powerful guys with big egos who didn't see eye to eye. And ultimately, o O'Malley said, screw this. I'm going to go to L.A. where I can build the stadium I want to build. Yeah. And then ultimately, if you look at it, like maybe Moses wins the battle because, you know, O'Malley goes somewhere else. But then the, the New York loses the Dodgers – and then if you compare the legacy of Shea Stadium to Dodger Stadium, it, it's no contest. You know, the O'Malley's, the, you know, his his vision really 
It's incredible. I mean, there's not a nicer stadium than Dodger Stadium. And, and yeah, sure, Boston and, and Wrigley have older ball fields, and there's maybe more nostalgia with them. But they're not nicer places to go see a game at. I don't know if you've ever been, but they're um, – I wouldn't say they're dumps, but they're not what Dodger Stadium is at all. And so compared to Dodger Stadium, they are a dump. I've been, I've been to Fenway never to Wrigley. Fenway's beautiful. And then once you're sitting in your seat and you're, like, in that little band box and you have the atmosphere, it's great. But, like, yes. not so great. Uh, and I mean, to me, Dodger Stadium is still the best. It's my favorite ballpark. I, you know, I feel strongly about it. It's probably why I wrote a book about it. But, <laughs> um, yeah, if you look at the other stadiums built also around that same time, Shea Stadium, Candlestick, a lot of those two multi-sport stadiums that were built in the sixties, right around the same time as Dodger Stadium, they're all gone. They were all terrible. Uh, the Dodger Stadium was the exception because it was built privately I think, and because it was baseball only and it had a specific purpose and it was all geared toward that purpose, which was making baseball just pleasant to watch. And that was like itself kind of a revolutionary idea. Like O'Malley wanted to build a stadium where kids would want to come and women and people who were not necessarily part of the fold of Major League Baseball fans in the 50s. He had a broader notion of what it could be. Would you compare the other ballparks of that era that do still exist? You you're left with, um, you know, Oakland County Stadium, and and the Big A out here in Anaheim by where I'm at. And again, both of those stadiums they pale in comparison. Like just in terms of functionality, beauty, you know, being modern, Dodger Stadium is just significantly better than both of those places. Yeah, I mean, Angel Stadium has changed so much, right? They have redone, yeah. redone, and they're going to redo it again now. Um, yeah. The Coliseum is like not even really a baseball stadium. It's a big old football stadium with the weird tarps and stuff. Yeah. The only stadium probably like close is Kauffman in Kansas City. And that was built yeah. in the 70s. Uh, it's a baseball only stadium. It's really nice. But that was, that was more than 10, 10, 15 years after Dodger Stadium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then just a little more on the O'Malley thing. When you balance everything out, how do you how do you sort like the good that Mr. O'Malley brings versus this you know this aspect of what that what has to happen to build the stadium because ultimately you know nobody wants this outcome but is there a better outcome was there another way to do this how do you sort out the good and bad for Tom what's your I keep wanting to say Tom O'Malley damn it um, Mr. Well, O'Malley how do you sort out the good and bad on your scale I mean I'm not God. So I'm not going to sit here and like be the judge of who's good and bad, but right. I will say like, I think a better outcome would have been if those communities were left alone uh, and they were never, you know, taken away to build that housing project. A better outcome is probably if the housing project doesn't collapse under a red scare conspiracy, not that it would have been better to have a housing project, but I think justice wise it would have been better. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think like society having to go through the red scare and have this fear mongering and a lot of corruption in LA politics in the fifties, which is also happening right now. There was a LA council member arrested last week or this past, yeah. this week for taking bribes from real estate developers that yeah. literally happened in the fifties. It um, does not stop. No. And so, I mean, it's better if it isn't so dirty and ugly and unjust to these families, you know, mm -hmm. that to me would be a better outcome. That said, Dodger stadium is beautiful. It's a great ballpark. It's a silver lining. I think that something that so many people love came out of something so horrible. But it's also part of the tragedy. I mean, if you had a house there and you see Dodger Stadium now, your heart sinks every time you hear Ben Scully's voice or see the stadium lights at night from across the city. I mean, that's, that's reality for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, it's sad. Yeah, it is. And maybe the existence of living in a government provided housing project would have been worse than where they ended up. Who knows? I mean, that's certainly a viable outcome. But to be ripped from your home, you know, on live TV, it's uh, it's shocking. The other question I wanted to ask contextually is, is my perception is, is that the emergence of Fernando Valenzuela and the Dodgers' overall efforts to to you know go and scout in Mexico have sort of 
for the community, I won't say the folks who lived in that part of LA, but for the community as a whole, uh, brought some closure and some healing to to the Mexican community in LA. Is is that a correct assumption, or is there still quite a bit of animus? I think there's still animus from some people, and I think that some people would say that that is a correct assumption. I, I, it's hard to be, I'm not a part of that community, you know? It's hard for me right. to say, oh, well, everybody was okay after Fernando came. I, I don't think that's fair. It's kind of a neat package to say, but Fernando couldn't give them their homes back, you know? He was a pitcher, yeah. a really good one. It's interesting, actually, Walter O'Malley, regardless of the evictions and of the way he got the land, he was thoughtful about marketing to a Latino audience as soon as he came to LA. I mean, he used to have Spanish language broadcasts in Brooklyn uh, some games. And then once they got to LA, they started the first full-time Spanish language radio team. They had Rene Cardenas and they had Randy Harin that the following year. And Harin is still with the Dodgers, which is miraculous. Yeah. He, we used to tell his scouts before Fernando came that he wanted a Mexican Sandy Koufax. That was, that was what he would tell people. He said, we want to get a Mexican Sandy Koufax because he wanted Mexican American fans to come to Dodger Stadium. And that was not because of anything other than being a smart businessman. He knew there who lived in LA and he wanted the Dodgers to appeal to everybody. Yeah. So I mean there like, again, like that scale, it, it's tough to put into the right position. Let's get into the families that were there. Obviously the Red Scare takes away the project that was gonna come. But what was what was like was that area just in limbo? Was there any other design for for that area? Were they still trying to figure out the housing project? What what was the state of it? You know, ten minutes before the O'Malley's show up in mass with their helicopter looking at property. So the project was officially scratched in nineteen fifty three after the mayoral election here, brings in a new mayor named Norris Polson to LA. And Polson was very much like, I hate to say it, he was pretty much a patsy for like the Chandler family and a few like kind of powerful real estate interests in LA at the time. They recruited him to run, they funded his campaign. They ran a really brutal campaign against this guy named Fletcher Bowron, who had been in office for a long time, and was a pretty popular moderate mayor, but who supported public housing. And when Paulson came in, there was a lot of debate over what would happen with this land. It was, I mean, it's a huge parcel, 300 acres, right in the middle of the city, next to Elysian Park, next to the police academy. So there was a million different options that were thrown about. They were going to put a community college there. They were going to put an airport, there were cemeteries, every everything, a zoo. Uh, it came pretty close to being a zoo instead of Griffith Park. Um, it could have been a lot of different things. And keep in mind that this land was taken with eminent domain. Yeah. So it had theoretically, theoretically, to be used for a public purpose, right? And there's this debate over what's a public purpose for this land. And, you know, ultimately the city decides that a privately owned baseball stadium is a public purpose. How did they get that through? <laughs> if it's going to be, you know, yeah, like, the city no, doesn't own this. No, the, the way they got it through was very, very brutally. It was it was not easy. First, they, they struck a deal with O'Malley. And, I mean, instantly there were lawsuits, right? You can't imagine that people were going to be okay with that. There was, there was a lot of kind of weird political alliances. You had, on one hand, you know, these Mexican-American families in, that were still there fighting. And you have this sort of like, small homeowner kind of conservatives who lived in the valley at the time uh, for the most part who didn't like the idea of you know government handouts to private enterprise so this sort of like libertarian and immigrant alliance uh, mm -hmm. being against the deal and you also had people who were in the entertainment business and didn't want the Dodgers to come so like movie theater owners and the San Diego Padres or the Pacific Coast League you know all these different uh, different organizations who are kind of fighting to stop the Dodger deal. So there was lawsuits, first of all. Second of all, there was a ballot measure. There was a referendum in the city of LA in 1958 over there. That's what it really came down to. And it was right after the Dodgers moved to LA for the 58 season. Uh, in May of that year, they voted on whether or not to approve this deal. Yeah, that's a lot of fighting to get this sorted out. <laughs> It was ugly. And O'Malley arrived in LA on his jet, you know, like the triumphant hero. We're bringing the Dodgers to LA. There was a huge crowd at the airport. 
he steps off the plane and he's immediately hit by a process server. I, like <laughs> the second he lands in LA, this this fight was it was knocked down, like drag out, ugly. Yeah. The the ballot measure it was fifty two percent to forty eight percent. I mean, it could have swung the other way, and yeah. there would have been a Dodger Stadium. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just for funsies, where would you have put Dodgers? Let's say the Dodgers come here. Where do you put them? Do you put them out by Griffith Observatory? Where where would you? Because you know the area, you lived out here. What would be the other spot that would be great? I don't know. I, I think that um, they probably could have put them where the Coliseum is, somewhere in that area. There's a lot mm -hmm. of space, sports arena over there. I, I, I tend to think that there's too many sports stadiums in LA. Like between, I don't think you need the Coliseum and the Rose Bowl and a new football stadium in Inglewood. They could have put them in Inglewood. They could have put them in the Baldwin Hills, probably where those oil fields are. Um, there was some talk around the Silver Lake area, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. where that would be now because it's so different. Yeah. Um, they talked about Anaheim. I mean, the Angels came and built Angel Stadium just a few years later in Anaheim. And that's easy. I mean, they just knocked down some orange trees and and uh, put some piles in and off you go, you know? Yeah, totally different thing. <laughs> uh, okay, so so let's talk a little bit about these families. Tell us their story, like their saga. I mean, it's one thing to say, yeah, they came in and it was horrible and everything, but let's get into who they were and, and what life was like for them. Are, they, are these... You know, are these illegal families? Are these shanty homes? Because a lot of times it's described as being like a bunch of lean twos and chickens. That's a, that's a lie, I would say. Like, so in order for the city to justify knocking it down uh, and, you know, raising it to build a public housing project, they had to paint the communities as slums, right? The slum was like an actual designation, a legal definition of a slum. But a lot of these homes were like normal residential two, three bedroom clapboard homes that you would see anywhere else in LA. A lot of them, in fact, were wheeled down the hill and like brought to other parts of the city. The set of To Kill a Mockingbird, the movie, was made out of homes from Palo Verde. Wow. Like, yeah. The So, I mean, houses, they were just regular houses for the most part. You know, some were nicer and some were less nice, just like any neighborhood. Um, most of the families... Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Nicer and somewhere less nice, just like any neighborhood. Um, most of the families moved there around the 20s. Uh, that was when the neighborhood really was subdivided and settled a little bit before that. And a lot of them were immigrants from Mexico, kind of the first generation, and they wanted a place where they could buy a home in LA. And it was very hard to do that if you were not white at that time. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of restrictions on who could buy houses. So this was a place where you could buy property. A lot of the houses were built by hand, by the homeowners. And settle down and sort of start your American dream, right? You have a little pot of land, work really hard these families would you know go work in the fields in like fresno and delano in the summertime to save money um work the railroad yards worked yeah. in brick yards this you know regular kind of blue collar people and the next generation was born in america it was sort of the classic american dream they sent their kids off to world war ii a lot of them didn't come back um they felt connected to the city and to their to their land and so when they were being told that what they had was a slum. That that was obviously very, interesting. and you know these are people also who had been fighting to get better city services. They had been fighting to get you know bus service up the hill to where they live. They had been fighting to get more paved roads in their neighborhood, and the city had been denying them those things. So you get to this point where you're like, you're calling me a slum, but you're not like fulfilling your end of the contract to help our neighborhood grow. You're not doing right. you know, code checks. You're not providing public transportation. You're not helping with all these basic infrastructure needs that we pay taxes for. And it was sort of this just tragedy of, I guess, racism and how, you know, who gets to have a voice in, in LA at that time. Leading up to the announcement that the Dodgers are going to move, it's, um, you know, this is a championship caliber team. They'd won their first World Series in 55. They had battled for World Series pretty much nonstop. The the 15 to 20 years prior. And then they say they're coming. What was the initial reaction of the neighborhood? I mean, because surely they're like, 
you know, not like, oh, they're going to move here. You know, they're, they're thinking they're going to be somewhere else because they have homes. What, what, what was the news taken like in the Most Valley? It was gone by then, right? So, like, the time, by the time the Dodgers announced the move, it was after the 1957 season. Um, right. and, and by then, the neighborhood was, didn't really exist. Most of the houses had been cleared out by the end of 52, 53. So, the idea was that they were going to move there. So, the families that were there, they kind of dug in their heels even more. Uh, and continue to file lawsuits and to fight for their homes. It was, you know, it's a question of we we don't have a problem with the Dodgers for the most part. We have a problem with false pretenses by which you took our homes. We have a problem with the city. And if for a lot of them, it was just about getting a fair price. It was like, well, look, if you're going to take our homes to build a baseball stadium, you better, you better pay us like it. Yeah. And, and so talk about the timeline, because I, I want to make sure we're all clear on this. So the neighborhood is being choked out, it sounds like, by the city in terms of denial of services. When does all that st start and stop? And then what's the lag between that part of it and then the folks who stay and dig their heels in? Kind of sure. talk about that timeline. So the neighborhood was choked out pretty much from the start, to be honest. Like They never really got a fair shake. And so I'm talking about the 20s, 30s, 40s, 1949. The housing project gets passed. In 1950, the families get eviction notices, basically saying, "We're going to come and take your home away. You have a choice." Uh, that process of you know people selling their home or not selling their home and negotiating, you know, the city comes in with eminent domain to assess the value of homes, and that's a really convoluted process, of course. And like you know, there's an assessor, and there's a judge to overrule the assessor. So you know, people are some people are selling, some people are staying, some people don't want to leave. The neighborhood sort of falling into a little bit more disrepair and, you know, houses are getting wheeled down the hill. Other ones are getting knocked down. It's a very, you know, now we see Dodger stadium as this very flat, right. The big stadium there. It was not like that. It was, it was a kind of more rag rocky and kind of ravini terrain at the time. So this process is starting to kind of level the land a little bit is beginning and and then in 52, 53, well, 53 really, the housing project has crashed. And that's when things sort of grind to a halt. And you have this okay. limbo phase where you're like, most of the houses are gone, but some people are still there, but the city doesn't really know what to do with them. It's not really fair to take them out right now and to physically kick them out to do nothing with the land. So a lot of the families just stayed and they, they didn't even own the titles to their land at that point. The city had taken the titles forcefully in a lot of the cases. Mm. But they also didn't really want to kick them out because, yeah, would, I mean, they couldn't, you know? So, so yeah. there's a strange sort of limbo phase that lasted for, for years before the Dodgers came. And that's where, that's where things were when the move was announced. So you know, when the move is announced, how, what's your estimate? How many people lived up there? I don't know, probably like... 100, 150, not that many. Right, right. And I mean, and I can, like, if you came to me, I'm the mayor, you know, and it's 1956 or whatever, 57. Like, how many people, 100 people? Let's just get them out of there. But but I would, as mayor, you know, because I'm, you know, that's the that's what I mean. The I wouldn't want to just, like, yank them out of there. I'd want to make sure, like, what do we need to get these guys out of there? How do we negotiate something? Even if it stings us a little bit, these folks are losing their, their livelihood, their homes, that kind of thing. How did that go down, though? It went down the opposite. It was very oh, much, we are, what a surprise. like, we have a deal with the uh, The city government, you know, keep in mind, and I, not to like harp on it, but it was super racist, just super racist. These were Mexican people. It was an all white government for the city. They did not have any respect or regard for them. The city technically owned the land for the most part, you know, for the Adechiga family that I write about. Yeah. When they, when they lost their, their property, um, lost it because they still live there. The initial assessor the city had hired, or the housing authority had hired, or whoever, said their their homes. They owned two homes on three adjoining lots were worth seventeen thousand five hundred dollars, not that much. A judge overruled that and said, "No, we're only giving you ten thousand fifty dollars." Oh, and the Adechiga said, when it all came down to it in fifty eight fifty nine. All we want is to be paid the $17,500. Please just pay us what you initially said you were going to pay us. That's fair. We'll leave. The city refused to do that. 
and refused to do that and refused to do that. And this standoff over seven grand, which compared to the price of Dodger Stadium and all these things, is what led to sheriff's deputies forcibly evicting them on TV. I mean, could you imagine that the cost of those evictions must have been more than seven thousand dollars? Easy. The cost of the operation of that eviction itself, yeah. the enforcement of that eviction notice cost more than $7,000. You have to bring in utility crews. You have to bring in movers. You have to do all this stuff. And they, the city was so self-important, I think. You know, you had a lot of, you know, you had the city attorney going on about the rule of law and how if if they don't take the $10,000 and leave their home, then the Constitution is going to be in flames. You know, just like these ridiculous assertions that, it's tragic and surreal to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Are we being unfair in terms of, you know, like would we have acted differently in, in the fifties if we were in the same, if I'm the city attorney, I mean, is it possible to be better? I think it is possible to be better. I mean, some of the families that were on a slightly different legal track than the Adechiga family that were still there, they did not reach a deal with the city. The city did not have like the legal cover to kick them out. So they got to stay. And ultimately, they got paid out of pocket by Walter O'Malley, and they got paid a lot better. Because uh, O'Malley, I think he saw the evictions and saw how bad that looked. And he said, I'm just going to open my wallet at this point. He probably had done that before. I think had he known how badly his partners in this endeavor would have handled it, he probably would have said, screw it, I'll pay the seven grand, because he was a smart guy. But I also think he wanted to lay off at that time, and he probably – wanted to let the process play out. I, I have to imagine he regretted it though. Yeah, I mean, at some point, like again, this is hard and there is no good solution. Once this whole thing gets moving, you know, it has to happen. It's a hundred families, so what? Like in the terms of millions of people. But the the, the reality is, is there are there are actual people that, that need this, uh, that need something. Do, do the communities move in mass to somewhere in LA? Was there any kind of accommodation like no, I mean, they, they did not. They, a lot of people moved to East L.A., Lincoln Heights. You know, at that time, L.A. was still pretty redlined. It was still pretty hard to buy a house if you're Mexican in a lot of neighborhoods. Mm. Um, so they spread out. Um, they did not spread out spiritually, though. They The communities stayed really united, even in their kind of exile. Um, and even to this day, they meet every year for a picnic in Elysian Park, right next to Dodger Stadium. And it's a pretty incredible thing, actually. We're talking yeah. about years later. Were the, new, were the neighborhoods in general, were they united or were they fairly distinct because they're in different parts of the, of the terrain? No, it was one of those things where they would have little rivalries between them, but then they were united against the outside world. Mm -hmm. uh, Palo Verde was like the nicest, most developed neighborhood. So like the people from La Loma and Bishop would have said that they were like a little bit uh, stuck up. You know, it was, huh. they had little little rivalries the way that neighborhoods have rivalries um, and yeah. kids' neighborhoods have rivalries. And then, you know, there were other neighborhoods nearby, too, that like Alpine and Chinatown and, you know, uh, Solano Canyon, which is still there, uh, were kind of all adjacent. And, yeah, there were rivalries between them, but there was also a sense of solidarity, um, especially when the city came for them. Yeah, yeah. And then did any of the families wind up with nothing or did everybody at least get like the 10 K or whatever the offer was? The homeowners usually got something, something small, you know, you never get fair value when there's only one buyer for your home. Right. Right. Uh, so most families who own homes got stuff, not all the families own homes. Some of them are renters and they, they got nothing. Did the renters fight to stay though, or, or were they more willing to leave since they were, you know, renters? They fought to stay too. I think some of them did some of them who, to the point they could, you know, if you're a renter, you don't have a lot of rights. Uh, they don't have a lot of a lot of say in it. Your landlord is going to decide that. Yeah. And there was there were some outside landowners who, you know, didn't live in the community, uh, who sort of banded together with the community members, the homeowners in the community to, you know, kind of wage legal war against the city for the to stop the housing project. You know, and they, they they were organized. They protested at city hall. You know, they went on TV and the radio, they got into the papers. This was not like a, a small thing. You know, this was a real concerted effort to stop the housing project initially and to maintain their, their community. Mm -hmm. 
when when you look at the uh, the outcome in terms of everybody having to be pushed out from around Dodger Stadium, and you look at the players on both sides, who stands out on the LA on the government side as being particularly onerous, or you know, like if we could replace this one person in terms of history, gosh, this whole thing might have gone more smoothly. I would take Norman Chandler, who was the public for the LA Times at the time. He was just the most powerful guy in the city. Uh, he pulled the strings. He was just, I mean, the LA Times, you know, city city council reporter, this guy named Carlton Williams, he would take instructions from Chandler down onto the floor of the city council and instruct council members on how to vote. Uh, could you imagine that? It was, it was yeah. a really, the LA Times now is, you know, this big kind of sort of vanilla institution in our city but at the time it was a reactionary paper it was so conservative like and not conservative because like i don't think chandler had particularly conservative values but conservative in the sense that he had a big real estate empire he wanted to protect and he was mm -hmm. totally shameless in you know driving up racism racist fears the red baiting all the all the stuff you can do to advance your agenda he was willing to do it and i think if it wasn't him, it might have been somebody else. But he's the guy I think about first. And then if you were able to give counsel to the families that lived up in the Chavez Ravine area, you know, back then, what, what would be like if you could just say like one thing to him, like, hey, this is this is my advice. I'm coming to you from the future. I know about this thing. What would you say to these folks? Oh, I don't know. I mean, they tried so hard. They I mean, they had lawyers. They had you know, considering a lot of them didn't even speak English, they did an incredible job fighting for their homes. It's, I'm sorry, you know, that, <laughs> I don't know what I would say. Uh, keep fighting, I think. It's, it almost feels like inevitable that they're fighting for their homes. Yeah. What about, um, it's just, a, it's, it's frustrating because this could have been so much better. Like, you know, just offer, and, and I'm spending other people's money in another time, but, why not just come with a blanket offer? Like, not only are we going to pay you for your house, you know, below market rate, but we're going to wedge off this hunk of this. LA has so much land. You could literally just pick a canyon and say, this canyon is now yours or whatever it is, you know, and, and give them something else. It just it bugs the crap out of me that this had to go down the way it did with so few families. Like, it could have just, you know, this is for the greater good, but we also want to make sure you guys are taken care of. Was there Was that voice available at all? There was one council member, I would say, who really embodied that voice. His name was Edward Roybal. He was the only Mexican-American council member. Uh, and he was a supporter of the Dodger deal overall, but he also was very much an advocate for the families and that their voices be heard and that they get treated respectfully. Um, he thought they had a point. Yeah. Uh, there was also a, a couple of like more libertarian conservative council members uh, who opposed the Dodger deal. This guy named John Holland in particular, who's mm -hmm. a council member. He, Holland really believed that the whole thing was a big conspiracy and that the Dodgers had been planning to move way before and he spent years trying to prove it. Uh, he never really got there, but he, he advocated for the families as well, uh, but it wasn't enough. Yeah. Did the families win anything in this during their fight? I mean, some of the families got paid out, right? And I think, I'm not sure, but I think I've heard rumors that there were some lawsuits that were settled out of court with the O'Malley's that that they they got money from, but not from the city. The city has never really apologized or done anything. And to me, it was the city that was the kind of primary villain in this story. Um, but no, they didn't really get anything. Was it worth it? No. <laughs> I mean, I love Dodger Stadium. <laughs> I absolutely love it. It's a beautiful ballpark, but I, I don't think it, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard for me to value a, a building more than people's dignity and lives. And like, yeah. you can love Dodger stadium and also say and know and go in there with an understanding that it's existence is the last act in a Shakespearean tragedy. I mean, yeah. like that's, both things are possible, uh, to me, at least. And it's okay to be critical of things that you love. And, like, I love the city of L.A. and I love the Dodgers and Dodger Stadium. But, like, it's screwed up, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it was worth it. I think 
It should have gone that way. Uh, but at the same time, had they built a public housing project there, that housing project almost certainly would have been a failure considering the way that housing, public housing was, you know, yeah. sort of treated in this country and fell out of favor. So those families lose their homes to build public housing projects. The public housing projects fall into disrepair. City sells the land, it probably becomes like a mall or something or apartment buildings. Like, yeah. Uh, or if they stayed, it's very likely that that neighborhood would be gentrified right now. And we'd be talking about families that are losing generational wealth because you know, real estate developers are coming in and sort of changing the way they, they live. I mean, sort of tragic from all angles. Yeah, I mean, it would, without a doubt, it would get filled up with, um, you know, 50s era ranch homes that are owned by folks who act. I mean, that's, you know, or right for folks who act. And that's who lives in those areas, right? I mean, that's it would, a park and yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be the exact same thing. Um, yeah, it's such a hard thing because, you know, people or things like, uh, in part, I understand like Chandler's position. He is a property developer you know he's into you know real estate and so people are, are secondary to that he just needs them to buy things you know and and that's how he protects his wealth and someone like Moses is like we have a lot of people they're gonna have to move they need places to go to congregate and so you know we have to deal with these buildings and these these you know large infrastructural items and inevitably it is it is the people and usually the poorest people that pay the price because their land is either cheap already or we you know choke off all the resources to make it un you know worse than it was before and it, it's always human suffering that comes with these kind of development projects yeah i mean shit rolls downhill you know like it was very much powerful preying on the weak relatively and what i think is remarkable about the story is the way that these neighborhoods fought and the way they banded together and the way that they didn't take this as victims yeah uh, if they didn't fight, you know, we wouldn't be talking right now. Probably, it's yeah, that, that's true. And I was going to ask, like, does any other stadium have this kind of legacy? Where you know, I mean, because stadiums are built on public land all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think to a certain point, some uh, all stadiums do, right? There's always something there before. There's always, you know, we're seeing in Inglewood right now where you have a neighborhood that you know the stadium is being built where the horse track was, but like a whole neighborhood is going to change, uh, right? home values or changing rents for commercial spaces, all these long time businesses that have been there and that have been serving the community are getting kicked out because rents are yeah. tripling or whatever it is. Uh, so I think it just happens every single time. It just happens differently. You know, what you have ultimately is powerful, wealthy people deciding what is good and okay yeah. for yeah. less powerful poor people. Uh, and that's sort of the nature of real estate development and especially Canadian projects. You know, as I think about stadium projects, maybe this is actually the ideal, like the least worst of all the options, because you think about Miami's, you know, beautiful, expensive stadium that nobody goes to and is paid for by the public or really by the tourist and publics. You know, it's. um, yeah, It's yeah. Getting these things right is not easy. There's a lot of very expensive public stadiums out there, and that's just not the way to do it either. Yeah, I mean, even this, though, this is a private stadium, right? O'Malley right. built it. He took a big loan out. Uh, but he also got the land so cheap uh, from the public. He, he traded another stadium that was called Wrigley Field in South L.A. for it. Right. Wrigley Field sat on, like, 10 acres. He traded it for 300. Um, he got freeway access, all this infrastructure, hundreds of millions of dollars of public funds went into building the way in and out of Dodger Stadium. I mean, it was not – totally nothing is totally private right even a privately owned yeah. stadium with a huge public investment um and a huge public cost so i don't know somebody asked me recently if like i think that there will still be ethical stadium construction in this country and i don't know if there can be it's a weird thing i mean i love sports but it's hard to imagine the right way to build a stadium unless it's like on the yeah well, you think about like any place where you're going to build a stadium already has millions of people in the surrounding area. So that means someone is going to have to give something up at a cost that that's not worth it to them, you know, because mm -hmm. they they live there or they work there or they earn their living there. Did this did this break anybody? This whole project, like just send someone over the edge and that was it. I mean, I think it broke the spirits of a lot of people. I think, you know, Abrana Arechiga, the matriarch of the family that I write about, the main character of the book 
would say later on that this was the greatest tragedy of her life. Oh. The woman who, who lost, she lost a son, you know, at like eight years old. She lived a very hard life. I mean, exceptionally hard. And she lost a husband. She, lost, she And she said that this was the thing that was the hardest because it was a whole city plotting against her. I mean, it was a rebuke of all the hard work she had done. You know, you, you pay into this system, you know, we are sold on the American dream of property ownership of you, you work hard, you save up, you get to have it. You know, that's the, that's the, deal. that's the social contract. And when you take that away from somebody, so somebody else can make bazillions of dollars instead of just millions of dollars. I mean, that's, it's devastating. Yeah, it would. It, <clears throat> would a better solution have been like, hey, you final, you know, 150 people or so, you know, there's so much land over there at Dodger Stadium. Like, give them a bit of it. Like, hey, we're going to let you develop this for business. Or, hey, we're just going to, why don't you go a little higher up on the hill and then you have the only, you know, ability to build on, the, like, because, you know, there's so much space. That, that stuff, like, those are, like, nice thoughts, but, like, that wasn't even yeah. a possibility. At the time, it was, screw you, get out of here. And that was yeah. it. I mean, there yeah. was there was no scent of compromise. Like that wasn't for whatever reason. Uh, I, the government wasn't built for that. You know, yeah. it was a big it's still not built for that. No, it's still not built for that. I think now maybe because of social media, because you know we've had oh, this is before the civil rights movement. This is before the Chicano movement. Like right, we had a little bit of progress on things like this, but there wasn't really a mechanism for them to to make their stand, you know, they, they became briefly after their home was demolished, they'd actually get family, very sympathetic and famous in LA. And that sympathy and fear, or not fear and fame quickly turned when it was revealed that they own other property elsewhere. Because if, if you own other property elsewhere, you can't be sympathetic. You can only be sympathetic if you're poor and desperate, but if you're an activist or if you're, trying to just make a point about your home and saying, no, this is where I live. I don't want to have it taken away by a private business using eminent domain. That is not sympathetic. Only It's only sympathetic if you are so, you know, desolate and desperate that you just don't have anywhere else to go. The public didn't care about them once they found out that they had actually done what they were supposed to do, which was to save money and buy property. Like that's, that's it's mind blowing. Yeah. When you look at the pictures of, of what life was like and whatever video exists, how would you characterize those neighborhoods? I would characterize them as, you know, very tight knit, family oriented. You know, they were a little bit isolated from the rest of the city. There was not a lot of ways in and out. And especially after the freeways went up, they became more isolated uh, just because the freeway blocked them. But um, they were nice places to live. They were like little towns inside of LA that, had their own culture, their own tight knit neighborhood spirit. Uh, you know, some people had lived in poorer homes, and some people lived in two story homes, TV and running water and electricity. Most people lived in homes like that. Uh, it was a neighborhood, ultimately, and it was a neighborhood that had a very special ambiance and it was a special location, and it had a special spirit to it. I sort of have brought this up, but I, I kind of want to ask your opinion on it. I mean, obviously, this is a tragedy, and this story, for some reason, has held out. Like, no one cares about how they built Safeco, and no one cares about, you know, all these other places. But um, have we gotten better at all at this? I mean, there's there's not really there's not true redlining anymore. A lot of things are a lot better, but I don't know. Are we better? I don't know. I hope so. I, I you know, I made a really conscious choice in the book to end it in 1962 with a stadium opening. Yeah. Probably, I didn't want to take away from like the power of this story and the resonance of it by opining about like current political events. Right. Uh, age. I think some things have gotten better and some things have not. Uh, I think when it comes to stadiums, I think like stadium stuff has actually probably gotten worse in terms of we now have this sort of like Marlins ish model for how to. Yeah. Think roughly extort cities to build stadiums and use tax dollars to subsidize 
wealthy companies. Uh, to me, that's worse uh, as a society. I and I I love stadiums and baseball and sports, but like I don't know. It just seems seems like there's a whole industry built on even just like the idea of proving that stadiums are a necessary, you know, use of our tax dollars. And there's like people who whose job is just to like create, you know, economic studies that are pretty clearly phony that they can wave in front of a city council so they can, you know, get that get that tax break or get that um, tax on tourist money to to build the stadium or whatever it ends up being. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, so they move into the new stadium and the team is it's really pretty good for quite some time. I mean, they win what three world, three World Series, or two or three at least, right around that time. Did that help in any way for any of these families, or is that just like we was <laughs> not too fresh? I mean, they won fifty nine in Coliseum, and they won 63, 66? Mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah, sixty five. Yeah. Remember, uh, but like, no, it doesn't help the families. It helps the city of LA. It's great for mm -hmm. the players. You know, it's. Maury Wills and Sandy Koufax and they were Willie Davis, who I read about in the book. They're a wonderful team um, in a wonderful ballpark. But like, did it help Abrana Rechiga? Hell no. Yeah, yeah. What about the players? Did any of them have anything to contribute? Or even uh, 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 Jaime Hyrum? I can never say his damn name right. How about the Mexican announcer? Uh, Ecuadorian. He. he oh, uh, okay. He actually didn't know anything about baseball before he got this job. It's pretty interesting. And now he's like, like he's he's gonna be there seventy years, or so. he's gonna he know he's purposely gonna pass Vin. He'd be like, I am the all time great. He he like spent a whole year learning how to how to, like how baseball works just so he wow. gets his job. It's pretty incredible. So no, the players didn't really have anything to do with it. There was one moment, and I write about it in the book when they had a like a you know they were being honored at City Hall, and the Arechiga family went down to protest and. So the players like were confronted with the people whose homes were getting taken away. Yeah, and that was that was it, as far as I know. And no real acknowledgement from the Dodgers. I mean, obviously, you know, Tom, uh, um, the O'Malley's pay whatever extra money and everything. But is there anything like have they done like a Chavez Ravine night in tradition to uh, you know sort of no. be aligned? Yeah. Fox on the team twenty years ago, they did like an olive branch ceremony, and they literally handed olive branches to family members. <laughs> I mean, better than I guess nothing. Maybe uh, yeah. that was the only time they've ever really acknowledged it. Yeah, yeah. I have not acknowledged it. It's not their policy, I guess. And it's business, right? Then, and it's over for them. Hey, uh, let me ask you this: What's next? What are you What are you working on now? Oh, I'm working on um, another book proposal. Not not baseball this time. Uh, history book, and I'm working on a kids book proposal also. Uh, nice. And I've got a sports history newsletter called Sports Stories, uh, sportsstories.substack.com. So always working on that too. If you guys want to buy Stealing Home, you can get it at the link that's on the page. I'll put it in the show notes as well. You can go to Amazon and type in Stealing a Home and it will come up and it's really easy to buy. Uh, I will I will be finishing it up probably here in the next couple of walks. I usually walk and read at the same time. Listen. Angels. Yeah, and uh, and if you want more, just stealinghome.la is that right for the uh, website? And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. when you get the uh, when you get the books sold and and you're ready to uh, come on the show. Let's come back and talk about the next projects. You got it. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. Yeah, don't worry.